Hey there YouTube, The Spicer here with a new series where we're going to take a look at the technical specs and lore behind some of the vehicles and battleships and cruisers and such of Gundam and other universes I want to look at. So it only felt right to start with the original OG 0079-1979 SCV-70 white base. Now before we get into a lot of the detail, let's take a look at the name because that actually changes a couple of times in its pretty short lifespan. The white base itself um, really only having an operational time frame of a little less than a year honestly between actual launch and being destroyed at the Battle of Abawaku, it actually has three different designations it goes through. Its prototype designation started as LMSD-71, then when it actually made it back to Earth after its journey to Side 7 and was adopted into the actual formal military for regular service, it was titled the SCV-70 White Base. After its destruction at Abawaku, however, the entirety of the Pegasus class, even the White Base that had been destroyed, were reclassified and retitled MSC and the white base was MSC-02, which were, stood for Mobile Suit Carrier, which is really the designated role the Pegasus class fit. Um, you know, it was originally designed kind of as a multiple role cruiser, battleship-esque carrier type thing, as a lot of the Federation ships were at the time. They kind of had multiple roles, but really the defining feature ended up being that mobile suit carrier portion. Now that the name's out of the way, let's actually take a look at the lore before we get to the technical specs of the White Base. The White Base is perhaps the most well-known Pegasus class carrier cruiser to exist not only outside of the actual in-universe canon, but as well as actually in the canon of Gundam. The main reason for that, there are two big ones. First, it's the first ship ever designed to be able to break out of Earth's gravitational pull under its own power. And that's mostly in part to the Minofsky craft system that is put on the white base, a revolutionary system using the Minofsky compact nuclear reactor that power mobile suits, but just upscaled, redesigned to fit ship systems. This allowed the eight jet propulsion engines in it to actually output enough power to get it out of the gravity well, and no ship, Federation or Xeon, was able to do that at the time. The next part of it, and mainly the, the biggest part, really, is the White Base was really the only Pegasus-class cruiser to see a large amount of combat in the one-year war. It even really had a short lifespan, um, really from September of 0079 to December of 0079 was its really operational time frame. Outside of that, the rest of the Pegasus class, for the most part, were too late. They were produced or really didn't even get out the doors until right at the end of the One Year War and even past that. There were a lot of them made even later than that because the Pegasus class did have a a pretty lengthy lifespan in terms of just the entirety of the class. So it was used in a lot of war propaganda by the Federation, especially since it had the Gundam, the White Devil on it to uh, help kind of bring morale up for a war that it was starting to feel like it was starting to kind of plateau or that the Federation felt like it was losing. Now into the technical specs, and there's a fair amount to cover here. The most interesting part of the actual technical design and build of the white base, other than it being bright white, was um, it was the first ship to utilize an advanced compartmentalized block construction system for the Federation and even really for Xeon. It really carries on to most of the other ships, the main ships we see in the Universal Century. Um, and that idea really started here. There were seven main blocks to the white base. You had the bridge, um, which kind of extended out above the ship where you'd have a pretty good viewpoint. The living quarters, which were located under that in the main central block. And you've got the central bow hanger just forward of that. And you've got the engine room behind the actual living quarters. The stern landing port, which is in the same kind of general area, the end of the living quarters-ish area. 
and then the two front leg hanger slash carrier uh, launchers. And this really helped it survive the time frame it did for the amount of fighting it saw. Um, the white base is notoriously understaffed and um, really failed to get a lot of repairs done in the time frame it was used and that really comes in part to being part of this block construction system where as long as the engines weren't critically damaged you could pretty much run the ship you know if you lost one hangar or parts of the living quarters or even the main bridge the ship could still go it wasn't something where it was dead in the water there were weapon emplacements generally in uh, most areas um, the, the main weapons are kind of in a, a line but for the most part you could keep the ship running in in some form of a combat role or at least enough to retreat to get repairs so in terms of armament it's kind of light but it's still pretty comparable to a lot of the same ships of the era it has a main gun, a two-barrel 580 millimeter gun located right above the second command bridge in the uh, central bow hangar. That's the primary gun. It has uh, a decent firing arc. It, of course, it can't really fire backwards, but if you've angled it enough, it is articulated enough to where it can shoot at pretty good angles. Pretty much directly to either side of that on those giant yellow wind blue discs are where the uh, mega particle cannons are housed they're two barrel um not near as strong as what we see later on in the uc of course but they're enough that ship to ship combat or even ship to base combat would be quite effective um and with one on either side you have the capability of not only shooting forward and i believe backwards but you could shoot side to side as well so Regardless which side your enemy is on, you would have at least some kind of firing angle on them. Now, outside of ship-to-ship -ship combat, they did have some more mobile suit-oriented weapons, where they have six anti-aircraft machine guns, which are really not designed to shoot down a mobile suit, but more just to harass them and try to get them away from the ship. Xeon notoriously didn't really use any spacecraft outside of like larger battleships slash carriers and mobile suits, of course. Um, and these were kind of part of the Federation's mind being a little stuck in old ways, but it at least did serve a purpose. They also had eight three-tube missile launchers located all over the hull as well. Um, so you do have some decent weaponry, weaponry in that time frame but you really do focus on the contingent of mobile suits and aircraft um, and spacecraft to really help take care of that problem and protect the ship itself. Now talking about the contingent of mobile suits this is really where the ship shines and where we start to see the Federation kind of take a turn but this is really the biggest portion here. Not only could the white base house and field six different mobile suits it could do other things and really six mobile suits for the time is quite the number i mean it's very it's more than i believe the moose eyes on the xeon side could carry i believe they carried only three or four so it does help there now of course for most of the war the white base only has three so it, it's pretty comparable but the ability to house six was a pretty big deal not only that, you could have two different core boosters as well as two different G-armors. So you have some light reconnaissance planes, and then the G-armors are just more bulked up version of those used more in space combat in conjunction with the whole core block system of the Gundam and the gun tank and everything like that. Then you have in the central hangar typically shuttles and the gun parry, which is designed more for... Um, transport than actual combat and you can use it like an assault craft but um, it's not really going to be very armored. You can drop the Gundam off or drop smaller contingents of troops or ground vehicles out of it but for the most part it's not going to be a super strong thing. I believe I could be wrong but I believe the white base could actually carry two of them. It only lists one but I believe in the show we see like or hear someone say that they can carry two. 
And then outside of that, they actually have the two hangers on either side for mobile suits that have the launch uh, pads themselves, the actual like little magnetic shooter thingies. <laughs> and a uh, very technical term there. And that really rounds out what this ship is capable of. And it's a really nice balance of the ability to not only field mobile suits, which at the time was really how war was being done and why the Federation was having such a tough time, and being able to do ship-to-ship -ship combat effectively. Of course, you know, in the show, you know, we're not going to see everyone, but, um, you know, we see a main cast of 10, 15 people, not counting civilians for the most part, of actual military personnel. And that really leads us to believe for a ship this size to run even on a bare bones crew like that, it was probably designed to have fairly minimal actual hands on manual labor done. Um, at least probably 100, 200 people were originally designed to be on the ship to fully function it versus the maybe 50 active members we see um, at some point or another in the show. Um, that it really becomes an odd thing, but for a ship this size, it we can estimate around that. The length of the ship is actually 250 meters. It's almost 100 meters tall, and it's got a wingspan of about 180. So we get kind of this cube-esque feel, which you don't get with a lot of ships. For a real-world comparison. The USS Nimitz, which is the first of the Nimitz class and one of the most well-known US nuclear-powered supercarriers, is 332 meters long. So it's actually not quite 100 meters, but pretty close, longer than the white base. Now, if we're talking science fiction, that's a little different. Of course, the two big ones people are going to go to are Star Wars and Star Trek. The Imperial One class Star Destroyer, the normal, regular old Star Destroyer we see in episodes 4, 5, and 6 of Star Wars, is about 1,600 meters long. So it's about six or seven white bases long. So much bigger, but of course it's meant to control larger areas of space. If we're looking at Star Trek, then we're looking at, of course, the original NCC-1701 Enterprise, which was about 288 ish meters long. Although we don't have any direct dates on when the white base was built or you know when it was commissioned or anything of that nature, we can assume that it was probably started in 0077 or 78, um, one year to two years for construction, even with the uh, block system making things a little bit quicker. Outside of that, we can estimate that it was originally launched probably late and you know, probably early summer maybe um, for it to arrive at side 7 in the time frame it did in September of 0079 and then it's tracked back to earth and then back to about a coup with you know in about four or five months span outside of that you know for it to only really be active for four to five months before it's destroyed that's really short time frame for it, as expensive as that ship had to be. Now, of course, you know, it did go on to be very, very memorable, um, being one of the few ships to take actual action in the war, um, as opposed to most of the other ships being Salamis or Magellan classes. Um, but it really did help turn the tide of the war, not only for mobile suits and having Amaro, um, but for really setting a precedent for the Federation having these multifaceted roles where the biggest thing that you were focused on was fielding mobile suits and being a carrier versus direct ship-to-ship -ship combat, they were really more operating bases than anything else. I would like to know what ships you guys would like me to talk about and you know, even if it's not a ship, if it's just the core fighter or the hover truck or something, any vehicle would do. Um, I, I love looking into that stuff. It's just something that's very entertaining to me. So absolutely let me know. And of course, tell me what you really like about the white base. Is it that it's iconic? That it has the first Gundam? Or do you think it looks goofy and wonky? Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. I really do appreciate it. And of course, please go check out Gunpla Network. 
I've do a lot of work for them right now, and of course Gundam Garage if you're looking into building any kind of model kits or any of that. Now, thanks for watching guys. Leave a like, a comment, subscribe.